So we're looking at chapter one or 21, the immune system. This uh, video will be on innate immunity. So immunity in general is the resistance to disease. It's how we fight any uh, pathogens that were, are potentially attacking us. And actually anything that that can go wrong. And a pathogen is a disease causing entity. Now the immune system has two parts. There's an innate non-specific part and there's the adaptive specific part. Now they mostly work with in conjunction. The innate part being non-specific is always active and will help you deal with any issue. Its advantage is that it's very quick. The adaptive specific part is much more powerful, but it takes longer to, to kind of get going. Um, so, well, we'll, we'll see this as the videos progress. So, all the textbooks talk about lines of defense, the first, second, and third line of defense. The first line of defense, the second line of defense is internal, and then the specific immunity is the third. Um, it makes it seem like that if one is, one, the next one comes in, the first one drops out, it's not true. They all are working simultaneously. But the best way to defend yourself to defend any entity is build a wall, keep them out. Um, it's uh, intact skin and mucous membranes uh, are the best defense. If the pathogens don't get in, then they can't they can't get a foothold. So keep them out. Um, so that's kind of the first line. Now. There are lots of ways getting in because you're going to get scratches and nicks and cuts and um, various other things going on. Plus, there are pathogens that have kind of adapted to getting through. Once a pathogen gets into you, then we kind of enlist the second line of defense. And this is um, internal. And it composed, it's composed of three basic parts. Cells that protect you, non-living extracellular proteins that are released to protect you, and physiological processes that protect you. Um, so these antimicrobial proteins are things like complement and interferon. The cells are phagocytes and natural killer cells. And the processes are inflammation and fever. And we're going to talk about each one of them separately. The third line is the adaptive, uh, and that's for a later video. So if we were to, if you look at this, the innate are the surface barriers, keeping things out, phagocytes, Natural killer cells, which are cells, inflammation and fever, which are um, processes, and extracellular stuff, antimicrobial proteins, which are complement and interferon. The adaptive subject of a different video. So the surface barriers aren't just simple surface barriers. There's a physical barrier, uh, the tight junctions and the cell-to-cell -cell contact along epithelium makes a physical barrier. The composition, so like keratin in your skin, um, is resistant to moisture and to acids and etc. And so there's this whole mechanical, and that makes sense. But there's also some 
chemical barriers uh, involved in the skin and mucosa. Most, uh, most of these surfaces are acidic and bacteria especially don't do well in an acidic environment. There are uh, different lipids that keep things supple like sebum um, that provide a waterproofing and a barrier uh, to getting in. There are um, digestive enzymes that are secreted. Uh, there are lysozymes, um, which are which cause lysis, uh, and they're found in tears and saliva and things like that. And then there's just mucus. The mucus is just provides more of a barrier. And these are all secretions. You know, so like mucus-coated hairs in the nose, uh, cilia, those sorts of things that move mucus around. <clears throat> if the pathogens get inside you, we're going to deal with these six things. Cells, phagocytes, natural killer cells, responses, fever and inflammation, and interferon complement. Geez, that's about three times I've said that. Must be important. Okay, so the phagocytes, the two most important phagocytes are the uh, macrophages and the neutrophils. So macrophages really start out as, um, as monocytes in white blood cells. They're made in the bone marrow and they migrate and then uh, they become phagocytic when they're in the interstitium. Most of them are free macrophages, when we think of macrophages, that wander through the spaces in the tissue, in the um, reticular connective tissue. Some of them are permanent residents, like Kumpfer cells and in the liver and, and such, uh, Langerhans cells in the skin. So, um, but they're still phagocytic cells. Neutrophils are phagocytic as well. They're the most numerous of uh, white blood cells. They're especially useful against bacteria. The macrophages eat just about anything. Neutrophils target bacteria primarily. So for phagocytosis, you need the phagocyte has to grab hold of the thing it's going to ingest. It takes some time for the, for the thing to be surrounded. It's endocytosis. Um, so there has to be something that the phagocyte grabs hold of on the pathogen. And we call this opsonization. Uh, this is proteins that our immune system sticks onto the um, onto the pathogen that allows the phagocyte to grab hold of. Um, these could be antibodies, could be complement proteins, either one. Uh, it's very common. In fact, it's necessary. Think of it this way. If you're in a bar and a bouncer is going to punch you, he's probably going to grab your shirt so you can't get away. And that's this adherence optimization. You can see the uh, this macrophage grabbing hold of these bacteria and they're spherical so they, that must mean they're a cocci. So you'd have the adherence and then the pseudopods grow around, trap it in a vesicle, then a lysosome goes with that vesicle. The enzymes that are in the lysosome mix with the thing. They kill whatever has been ingested, break it up, and then exocytosis, it's released harmlessly. So it's the digestion by the lysosomal enzymes that, 
that do this. There's peroxide and peroxisomes and things. Um, there are things called defensins. It doesn't really matter. All that, you, that we care about is that it's the phagocytes that actually destroy the pathogens. Almost everything else we're going to talk about in the rest of innate and adaptive immunity is all about enhancing the, the phagocytosis and making it more efficient for the phagocytes to destroy the pathogens. Now, sometimes pathogens, so the phagocytes, uh, take that back. The phagocytes only work in the interstitial space. That's the, that's the, the place that they, they can. They move in the interstitial fluid and they eat anything that is in the interstitial fluid. So some pathogens actually go intracellularly. They go into, into cells where they, they're out of reach of the phagocytes. So the way to get, we get them out is we kill the cell that they're hiding in. And that's the job of the natural killer cells. These are a nonspecific lymphocyte that will target a cell that has something wrong with it, whether it's infected with a virus or it's a cancer cell or whatever. The natural killer cells target it because that cell is not displaying the correct leave me alone sign. And then the natural killer cell secretes um, some chemicals that induce apoptosis, that cause the, the cells to die. When the cells die, whatever the contents of the cell come out into the interstitium and the macrophages and neutrophils eat it. Now, NK cells are also important for enhancing in inflammation. And we're going to see that inflammation is a good thing. And so NK cells killing our own cells to release the pathogen so that they can be destroyed by the phagocytes uh, are really important. Now, inflammation, most lay people think of inflammation as not a good thing. Uh, you know, we have anti-inflammatory drugs and, uh, oh my goodness, you have inflammation. Um, inflammation is actually very good. Uh, I tell stories in, in class about this, and so I'll try it on, on this video. If, um, if the, well, I once had a, um, a little rust hole on the door of my car and I brought it to a body shop and this hole was just you know it was about the size of a fingernail not a very big hole and when when the body man looked at it and said he, he was going to fix it what did he do he took a grinder and took the paint off of half the freaking door and then he ground that that little hole into something that was maybe, you know, a couple of inches around. And then he welded new, new metal in there and then filled it and sanded it and repainted it. So why did they do that? Like, why did they do destruction before, before fixing it? What he wanted to do was get back to good metal that had no rust in it. And so that therefore had to had to make the hole bigger. The same thing happens in our body. We've got some tissue that's damaged, maybe dead. We have to kind of clean it back to to good uninfected tissue to make the repair. We have to get rid of anything that's damaged or slightly damaged or could be damaged. So inflammation sets that stage for repair. Inflammation is also very good uh, because what happens is 
as blood comes to the area. So as blood comes to the area, so does more oxygen and nutrients and phagocytes and natural killer cells and all the things that we need to, to have the fight. Plus it puts a pressure towards the site of injury which then prevents the pathogens from moving away from the site of injury. So it prevents the spread of the damaged agents. It brings necessary materials, clotting proteins and things, to the area. It um, helps dispose of cellular debris and pathogens, and it's at the, the stage for repair. Most, most books talk about five cardinal signs of inflammation. Um, and it's interesting, this book lists the four, and when I was in school, we talked about four, but it's now more accepted to say that there are five. The mnemonic for it is PRISH, P-R-I-S-H. P is for pain. When something is inflamed, the inflammatory chemicals include prostaglandins and some other things that actually stimulate the pain receptors and you feel pain. Plus, the, the pressure will also cause pain. And pain is a good thing. It tells you to stop doing what you're doing and uh, it, uh, it's a warning system. So when you have inflammation, the inflammatory chemicals cause vasodilation, which means that more blood arrives than leaves, and so there, there's more blood there, and the blood's there for a longer period of time, and that causes the rest of the cardinal signs and includes pain. So R is redness, P-R. Redness it's red because there's more blood in the area. It's as simple as that. I is impairment of function. Really, if, so, if there's tissue damage, you don't want to exacerbate things by continuing to use it. So by stopping using it, by impairing the function, it localizes the problem, doesn't let the problem spread. S is swelling. It swells because there is more interstitial fluid. And there's more interstitial fluid because there is more blood in the area. And this swelling in the interstitial fluid gives more room for the, for the macrophages, et cetera, to move around. It, um, it localizes the pathogens, prevents them from getting away. H in the PRISH stands for heat. Blood is warmer than the rest of the tissue, so when there's more blood in the area, it just gets hotter. So P, pain, R, redness, I, impairment of function, S, swelling, H, heat, prish. So So oftentimes, so these toll-like receptors and the macrophages and damaged epithelial cells release um, chemicals called cytokines that promote inflammation. They're just the inflammatory chemicals. Will, so this would be things um, like histamine. Histamine is a vasodilator, um, which then causes more blood to come to the area. There are various blood proteins that will enhance inflammation. Prostaglandins, leukotrienes, complement itself. Right? And these things are all released by the phagocytes working, by the natural killer cells and the uh, adaptive lymphocytes. Basophils, which are a type of white blood cell, uh, the least common, their, their granules are filled with 
inflammatory mediators. Their job is to actually cause inflammation. It all adds up to dilation of the arterioles, which then is hyperemia, more blood in the area. That more blood means that the local capillaries are more permeable, more fluid leaks out and comes back. So you have some swelling and we have, and in this exudate, this, this liquid that leaves the bloodstream are clotting proteins, um, antibodies, white blood cells, all kinds of things, plus oxygen and nutrients. As we saw in the last video, the this will all be happening in capillary beds, and there are lymphatic capillaries there. And this extra fluid will draw into the lymphatic vessels and therefore isolate any contents, any pathogens or things that are there, and deliver them to the lymph nodes where they can be more effectively fought without spreading through the body. So this is just a chart of this. So the tissue gets injured, right? So you, re you release histamine and complement and all of this stuff that are inflammatory chemicals and the leukocytosis inducing factor, which, which increases the number of white blood cells. The inflammatory chemicals cause vasodilation of arteries, arterioles, which causes hyperemia, which leads to the heat and redness, locally increased temperature, increases the metabolic rate of the cells, so they, they are working better. The uh, increased capillary permeability lets fluid leak out, so the protein rich uh, causes pain and swelling and limitation of, of function but that all enhances healing. Um, it attracts the phagocytes and the leukocytes to the area via something called chemotaxis, which is basically following these chemicals. Um, it allows these leukocytes to marginate, cling to the capillary walls, and then undergo diapodesis where they leave uh, and go into the interstitium where they can phagocytize things, clear the area of debris and lead to healing, right? Um, so, and forms the scaffolding for repair. So all of these things work together. And they're all an important, they're all important. So, Phagocytes go to the inflamed areas. They're drawn to the inflamed areas, both physically and chemically. So the white blood cells arrive with the blood. There are chemicals released that circulate through the blood that cause the bone marrow to start making more white blood cells especially neutrophils, monocytes. These are called leukocytosis-inducing factors. Now, when, they, when these cells get to the capillaries, they stick to the capillary walls in an inflamed area, especially the neutrophils. And we call this marginization or margination. Margination is just literally sticking. Then these cells squeeze out between the epithelial cells and they step out of the bloodstream and into the interstitium. And we call that diapodesis. Dia means through. Ped means foot or to step. Pedals, like the pedals on a bike. Pedestal. So diapodesis mean, literally means to step through or to walk through. And then the inflammatory chemicals draw these neutrophils, 
via something called chemotaxis to the place that they're needed. Chemo, chemicals, taxis, carries you to your destination, taxi. So when we look at it, we have damage, inflammatory chemicals. The inflammatory chemicals cause more neutrophils to be made. The neutrophils stick, margination, then they squeeze through diapodesis, and then they travel to the site via chemotaxis. So leukocytosis first, margination next, diapodesis and chemotaxis. This brings us to um, these non-living extracellular secretions, really antimicrobial proteins. There's a, a bunch, but the two most important ones, the ones that we're going to talk about, are interferons and complement. Now, these things attack the microorganisms more or less directly. They, they, what they're trying to do is either disable the microorganisms or put them in a place where, where they are going to be eaten by the, the phagocytes. Or, and or they're slowing down their ability to reproduce. So there's fewer, them, fewer of them that need to be eaten. So we'll start with interferons. Now, in order to understand what interferons do, you have to understand how viruses work. What viruses do, a virus is a um, protein coat with a piece of either DNA or RNA inside it. That's it. There's no organelles. There's no facility to reproduce. There's no, there's none of that. So, what they need to do to reproduce is they have to take over a cell's um, protein synthesis mechanisms. The transcription and translation processes of protein synthesis within a cell. So, so a virus will enter into a cell through various means, and each virus has its own way of getting into a cell. Now, in the terms of uh, this SARS-CoV, so the, the, the COVID-19 coronavirus, the way that it gets in is that the, the spikes, protein spikes, attach onto the, um, the ACE2 receptors, the um, the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptors that are on most cells. And it uses this to gain access to the cell. Once it gains access to the cell, it takes over the protein synthesis. So if this is a skin cell that's supposed to be making keratin, instead of making keratin, it makes copies of the virus. So the virus will take its piece of DNA or RNA and start transcribing copies of it. The same way that we either replicate DNA or we make messenger RNA. Depending on which virus it is, it's going to take over one of those two things. And nucleic acids will be assembled in the correct chain because the virus has taken this over. And then that viral chain of nucleic acids will then get translated at the ribosomes to make the protein coat of the virus. And so therefore, the cell starts making copies of the virus instead of making the proteins that it's supposed to make. Because it's doing this, the physiology of the cell changes, and the cell releases a chemical, a protein called interferon. And what interferon does is it goes out into the interstitial fluid, and, the, and it 
enters into all the neighboring cells in the tissue, all the cells surrounding the infected, the virus infected cell. And the interferon then shuts down the transcription and translation processes in all the surrounding cells. So if so the virus infected cell will eventually fill up with viruses, burst, and millions of viruses will come into the interstitium where the phagocytes will eat them, but some of them will get into all the neighboring cells where they reproduce and growth becomes exponential. But the interferon shuts down the protein synthesis mechanisms in those cells, and so there's nothing for the virus to take over. And so that virus infected cell that's not reproducing gets killed by the natural killer cell or uh, a T lymphocyte, and that virus is then released into the interstitium where it's eaten by a macrophage. So the good thing about interferons is it slows down the rate of reproduction of the viruses. The bad thing is then it makes a whole bunch of cells useless. The, those cells will not be doing what they're supposed to do, which is making proteins. So they're just useless to the body and they never come back. They have to be replaced. So this is just, so the host cell releases the interferon, the interferon, and there's nothing to take over. So the virus enters the cell, Interferon genes get switched on, interferon is released, it goes to the cell number two, and then turns, blocks the viral reproduction. They're made by all kinds of cells. Now interferons also activate the macrophages and mobilize the natural killer cells. It, they are kind of triggers that says something's wrong. So what do they do? They interfere with, with uh, viral reproduction. They also reduce inflammation. They, they, um, they moderate inflammation so inflammation doesn't get out of control. Right? And they say to the macrophages and the natural killer cells over here, now, complement is um, another set of antimicrobial proteins. There's about 20 proteins that are all part of the complement family. They all have names and numbers. They're regulatory proteins and everything. It doesn't really, I don't expect you to know those, just that there's someplace around 20 proteins. So what does complement do? Complement enhances inflammation, enhances the inflammatory response. Um, it kills bacteria and other cells, but mostly it's bacteria, by poking holes in it. It's called lysis, cellular lysis. And it enhances um, phagocytosis. It becomes the... Um, the shirt that gets grabbed a hold of it, it becomes the adherence molecule so that the bacteria can't get away from the macrophage. There's a couple of pathways that uh, will do it and I'm not worried about it. So, um, but one is the antibodies target the bacteria and then the complement follows that. Um, the alternative pathway is is more nonspecific. It's a series of steps. So it enhances inflammation, promotes phagocytosis, and causes cellular lysis. And it causes this by creating something called the membrane attack complex. And what really the membrane attack complex is, is you start inserting these proteins into the cell membrane of the bacteria. And then these proteins all float together and form a ring, which is a hole. Uh, and then now you've got a hole 
in the bacteria, which if it doesn't kill it, will wound it and slow it down badly enough that the phagocytes will eat it. It looks like this. So all of these proteins end up coming together and they form a whole cellular lysis. There's a number of ways that it's going to get there, but nevertheless, it enhances inflammation because it stimulates histamine release and increases blood vessel permeability. Is involved with, with um, chemotaxis. It coats the surface with proteins that the phagocytes can grab hold of. So, three things. Enhances phagocytosis, enhances inflammation, and cellular lysis. It pokes a hole in the bad guy. The last thing is fever. Now fever, again, is gets a bad rap, but it's a good thing. And really what it is, is a resetting of body temperature a little higher. It kind of raises the thermostat. And it happens because of something called pyrogens, generates pyro, generates fire or heat. And these pyrogens are secreted by white blood cells, macrophages, that are exposed to foreign substances. As these, as these white blood cells are working, they are releasing pyrogens, and you will set the temperature higher. Now, that higher temperature does a bunch of things. First off, it's going to increase the metabolic rate systemically, which means that you are going to be um, healing faster, that you will be creating more white blood cells faster. Uh, all of these things, by increasing the metabolic rate, increase the speed at which you are dealing with the damage or the pathogen. Fever also causes the liver and the spleen to take any iron and zinc that's available and store it away, sequester it away in the, the liver and the spleen. And iron and zinc are important for, the, for bacterial reproduction, uh, especially bacterial reproduction, but most microorganisms uh, need this. And so by not having it available, it slows down the reproductive rate. So it's going to speed up the rate of phagocytosis, the rate that you're making phagocytes, the rate at which uh, repair is going on. It's going to speed up the delivery of oxygen and nutrients. It's going to sequester away the iron and liver and slow down the rate of reproduction of the microorganisms. And as long as it's a low-grade fever, it will do that. The problem with fevers is that if the fever gets too high, then uh, it becomes dangerous because enzymes start to denature and physiological processes start to get disrupted by that. Fever is systemic. So to sum it up, Intact barriers, first line of defense, chemical and mechanical barriers. Second line of defense are two types of cells. Phagocytes, which actually do the killing, clean things up, clean up the debris, etc. They, phag they phagocytize things. Natural killer cells that kill any damaged cell, or any cell that's got a problem with it, so that the phagocytes can deal with it. Interferon, if it's viruses, will interfere with viral replication. Complement will enhance phagocytosis, enhance inflammation, and attack and the membranes, the cellular membranes of cellular pathogens. Inflammation, which is local, causes pain, redness, uh, impairment of function, uh, swelling, and heat. 
keeps everything there, increases the the whole response, um, and is local. And then fever, which is a systemic raising of temperature that that gives us benefits.